Okey-doke. We just gotta, we just gotta let the go. Same breath that Judge Jockins. Ruling which allowed televisions in the courtroom, as opposed to the experimental theory. And so, it's not unreasonable to assume that the great majority of people in this state watched me try being tried and convicted of two murders in the Kaya Mega case in Miami. Now you recognize, Judge Joplin, you recognize the effect of this publicity. I think you recognize it as a jurist, but you also recognize it as, a, as an intelligent scholar and as a human being. And so you moved this trial from, you allowed this trial to be moved from Lake City to Live Oak, and then from Live Oak to Orlando. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, that you would have to admit to yourself, and I believe you have stated on the record, that the, that the publicity that has tainted this case, in which it brought about the verdict that we have here today, was statewide. And there's no way that... has never stated that the publicity has tainted the no, trial no. or the verdict in this case. I meant to say the verdict was recognized the publicity was statewide. It's my contention that the tainted and contaminated this case. And that we could not escape it. We could not escape the reality in which pre-trial publicity influenced the presentation. In this case, we could not escape the way in which it influenced the jury that heard this case. Your Honor, you recognized at one point, I believe here in Orlando, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as I recall, you said in connection with our motion to continue this trial, that based upon what you knew, Orlando was as fair a place for this trial to be held as any other place in the state. Well, Your Honor, that's sort of treating fairness like a loaf of bread and saying that half a loaf is better than none. And what we got here in this courtroom was half a loaf of fairness because we had that, because the state and the court felt this trial had to go forward at this time. So we went forward with jury selection. And as one of my attorneys observed after several days, it was less a task of jury selection, a more task of jury imposition. And what kind of jury did we get as a result? Well, let me cite this. The most, the most typical example of a jury we got is a man who is responsible for the actual printing of the Orlando Sentinel Star, which printed some 283 articles concerning me and cases concerning me and about my background, the man Patrick Walsky. The man who was placed in that jury box when we were defenseless, when we had no more peremptory challenges. The man who later became jury foreman. been quoted in the papers as saying, well, he was guilty all as I saw, he was guilty all along. It wasn't any surprise to us. We listened to Mr. Walski when he was being questioned during Guadar. And there was no more hostile individual who sat in there during jury selection. No more individual more hostile to the defense than the man who eventually became the jury foreman in this case. What a fitting honor. a man intimately involved in generating the pretrial publicity should be placed on this jury when we couldn't get him off and should eventually become the jury for him. And what of the evidence or the so-called evidence the evidence in this case didn't come solely from the witness stand. It came from the newsstand, the television set. It came from the town gossip. We weren't limited here to testimony that came from that 
from that wooden stand. <coughs> Elementary knowledge of the human mind, Your Honor, I suggest, makes it impossible for anyone to honestly advance the theory that the people who are impaneled here, each and every one of them, with knowledge about my background and allegations about my past to put that under their mind. But we did hear evidence. We heard a lot of it. In fact, Mr. Walski was impressed by the amount of it. And so the, the state faced with making a silk purse out of a sow's ear built a case based on quality on quantity, not on quality, and attempted and succeeded, apparently, in overwhelming the members of the jury with quantity, without credibility, without quality. <laughs> Consider the parade of media-manufactured witnesses that you yourself, Your Honor, heard testify on this witness stand. Consider Jackie Moore, who saw a van weaving down the highway on February the 9th, and two years later, as a tourist walked into this courtroom and said, I recognize Mr. Bundy on January the 18th, 1980, as he was leaving the courtroom in this very case. Preposterous. That's the kind of evidence we're dealing with, and that is why this case was not based upon truth why this case was contaminated by publicity. Consider John Farhat, who after failing to identify a witness like that on the stand to point the finger at me, a man who thought what he saw occurred in the heat of sun, who couldn't even identify Lynn Thompson, a man he had seen for 20 minutes, four months earlier. Why? Quantity. As long as they got those fingers pointing at the defendant, that's all that mattered. Never mind whether it was truthful. Never mind whether it was credible. The only thing that jury was going to remember was the pointing of that finger and what they knew about that defendant and what they knew about me before they went to that jury box was enough. The combination of those two factors was enough. And last but not least, consider Andy Anderson, your fireman. The state's key witness. I don't think the state can deny this. The man who waited five months to come forward with his television identification, with his identification procured through the man, procured through media publicity. A man who had the audacity to tell that jury that he did not do so, that he did not come forward because he didn't want to get involved. The jury must have believed it. They must have believed part of what he said. And certainly the prosecution wanted the jury to believe the testimony of Mr. Anderson. Andy Anderson. Remember how he identified me in court? He sat in that witness chair and was asked to look around the courtroom. Asked to look around the courtroom to see if anybody in that courtroom closely resembled the person he had seen in front of Lake City, the man he had seen in front of Lake City. And I sat here like this, and I faced the man, and he pointed the finger right at me. He didn't identify the man in front of Lake City Junior High School. He didn't ask to see a profile. He didn't need a profile. He never needed a profile. All he needed was a face. All he needed to know that that was Ted Bundy and that was the man he needed to identify. So let's throw this nonsense about needing a profile to identify the man in front of Lake City Junior High School out the window. Andy Anderson's testimony is preposterous. But the jury must have believed him. <coughs> must have believed him in part. And apparently it made no difference to the jury that the girl Andy Anderson saw was not wearing a coat when we know Kimberly Leach was. Apparently it made no difference to the jury that Mr. Anderson described the purse being carried by the girl he saw as brown and the purse 
The man he'd been watching on television, seeing in the newspaper for two years, he did his job. He did his civic duty. <laughs> but he did not tell the truth. His testimony can't be wrong. Not by his work records. Not by his description of what occurred. Not by his original descriptions to Mr. Deagle and to the first hypnotist of what he saw occur in April. The manner in which the state used publicity to their advantage in procuring this conviction. Or Andy Anderson. He saw that little girl being taken across the street in April. And months later, thought he saw an abduction that occurred in, in February. But where? Over the middle of a highway. And start running around Lake City Junior High School looking for someone to abduct and murder. How fallacious a proposition. And yet somebody bought it. The jury bought it, but I don't buy it. This. That that's not the truth. It proves nothing. And it certainly doesn't prove that I wasn't that thing. But the jury apparently was impressed by such inferences which were without reliability and proceeded to deliberate but I maintain that the real deliberations in this case did not occur in this courtroom but in bar rooms around kitchen tables there were no deliberations here I'm glad Patrick Walsh he got a chance to, sh to, uh, to chat with a member of the news media we got some kind of insight into their, quote, deliberations, where it says very, very early in the deliberations, they took a vote. They took four votes. It was nine for conviction, two for acquittal, and one undecided. Three weeks of testimony, 100 witnesses, 100 exhibits, and very early in the testimony, they were overwhelmed by that quantity of evidence. They were not uninfluenced by those other deliberations that they had engaged in before they came into this courtroom. And they were not unmindful of the publicity that they had heard concerning this case before they came here. No. I, but not on the basis of the evidence. A name was convicted. I was not convicted by this jury, but a, a publicity created symbol was convicted. And the prosecution, contrary to the oft stated cliche that they had to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, didn't have that burden. Let's not fool ourselves that it was Mr. Africano, Mr. Thompson, and myself who had to prove Ted Bundy innocent beyond a reasonable doubt. And we failed. I from that witness stand that Ted Bundy was innocent beyond a reasonable doubt. Kimberly Leach couldn't testify. Now you're going to pass sentence on me today, but the sentence was passed months ago. As a result of publicity, suspicion and fear and a desire for vengeance, this sentence was passed months ago, Your Honor. 
while I may bear the awesome consequences of what you are about to do, I bear none of the guilt, and I bear none of the responsibility, because I did not kill Kimberly Beach. <laughs> Respond. Trial by jury. And after deliberation, a verdict was rendered. Finding the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy guilty of the following crimes: one, murder in the first degree of Kimberly Diane Leach, as alleged in count one of the indictment; two, kidnap of Kimberly Diane Leach, as alleged in count two of the indictment. The trial jury, after hearing additional matters, retired to consider and render an advisory sentence pursuant to Florida Statutes 921.141. The trial jury returned and in open court recommended the imposition of the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy for the murder of Kimberly Diane Lee.